<clears throat> All right, everybody. Looks like we are live for our MBC Sunday series with survivingbreastcancer.org. My name is Abigail Johnston, and um, I'm excited to be on the board of SBC and also just to spend time with Laura every other Sunday or whenever we can organize this. But um, the impetus for this series is to talk about those things that everybody's thinking about that nobody's really talking about. Uh, for those of us in the metastatic community, there's a lot of, um, there are little, there are those things that we are thinking about all the time, but yet aren't culturally acceptable to talk about. Um, and I think that one of the things that um, comes up a lot is the effect on our families. Um, yes, those of us with the diagnosis are handling the side effects or the things that come about because of cancer. We're handling them individually, but our families are also really affected by those things as well. And so when I saw the amazing project that Andra and Ilga put together, um, called Sister Hope, I knew that we absolutely had to bring them on the, um, the this webinar series so that they could talk about this because I know that um, from seeing all the comments and the discussions about it, that it was something that was deeply impactful for, for both of them. So without further ado, um, Andra and Ilga, would you uh, introduce each other or yourselves. I know we've got a slideshow with some some pictures. Um, so please take it away and talk about you individually and then we'll get into your project. Um, well, thank you, um, Abigail and Laura for inviting us uh, to talk about our project and our story. Um, if you can move on to the first slide, please. Uh, it's kind of a little bit of an introduction to ourselves. <laughs> um, we grew up in a very close uh, family of four. Uh, we had a dog and um, we were also very close with our grandparents. So we had two uh, incredibly strong grandmothers and a grandfather who were part of an extended family. Um, the household was quiet and full of love and support and um, gave us a great foundation. Um, as sisters, uh, we have traveled a bit. We haven't lived in the same city um, for a very long time. So when we do get together, it's usually somewhere else. So there's a picture of us on a cycling uh, trip to Northern France, um, cycling and camping trip, uh, where we ate <laughs> lots of really excellent cheese um, and baguettes. And hey, Elda, um, how, how far apart are you and Andra in age? Four years. Four years. Okay, you don't have to tell me how old you are, but. <laughs> <laughs> we also had a little bit of wine on that trip too. <laughs> a little you? bit. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think that's, uh, we did also yoga is featured quite a lot um, in our kind of activities. So we, we went on a kind of a yoga holiday to India, um, probably close to 20 years ago now. So. Um, so next slide is a little bit more about me. So I studied um, art and art history at um, in the Art Academy of Latvia um, when I was uh, 20. And also I went on to study um, MA at Concordia University. And basically I teach drawing. So in addition to my art practice um, and collaborative practice, um, I earn a living by teaching uh, drawing skills and also seeing, um, also seeing how you can use drawing to look at things differently as well. So I do a lot of work with um, people who don't normally draw and um, they often say things like, um, oh, I didn't see that, you know, so spending an extended amount of time looking, um, but looking and also recording or drawing um, kind of feeds into a, a new understanding of, um, of your area, for example. Um, I published a book uh, last year as well. And um, a large part of my work is um, teaching idea generation. So facilitating workshops on idea generation and um, helping people to um, 
kind of find new ways or uh, or um, develop new projects. And this is where uh, our work actually started together. To go on to the is next that, slide. The sketching perspective is that the book that you published? Yeah, it came out last year. Okay, is it is it in English or in another language? Yeah, it's in English. Okay. Um, I should probably say that I live in London, so I'm I'm speaking to you from London at the moment. <laughs> Um, but yeah, the book's in English, um, and it's it should be available. A friend of mine was recently bought it um, in California, so it should be available everywhere. Great. Well, well, we'll include a link to the book in the in the show notes when the uh, webinar gets uh, published. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name's Andra, and um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you, Abigail and Laura. Um, it's um, a little surreal actually to be here, um, but diving into um, a little bit of my background, um, I did a um, master's in nursing at McGill University from Montreal. I don't know if we mentioned that we grew up in Montreal, um, that's, that's our hometown. Um, and I, part of my um, uh, project or thesis was, um, I was part of a global health specialization. And so I spent a semester in Tanzania um, working with a group of peer health educators. Um, and that's an ongoing project um, through McGill that has been going on through the years. Um, so it's like building one project onto the next. Um, and so that was a really, um, a really uh, powerful experience for me. Um, so when, you were, when you were in Tanzania, were you working with other students or were you working... I was a student myself. We were doing okay. we were doing classwork in their hospitals in their in their hospital system, um, but then at the same time we each had it was my classmate and I um, that went just the two of us, and so we also had our own kind of projects that we worked on. And she worked in an AIDS um, an AIDS clinic, and then I worked with the outpatients. Um, um, the I worked with the peer health educators that would visit. Um, their local villages um, and support them, psychosocial support, giving them um, for those that are sick, orphaned. Um, so it was, yeah, we saw a lot of different things in the field. Um, that had to have been such an amazing experience. It was amazing. I learned a lot um, and I'm just delighted that the program's continuing and uh, yeah, it's it's it was a wonderful experience, so. Um, and the picture on the right is um, different. Um, I worked as a nurse in different areas. I worked in critical care. I worked in oncology for two years. I worked in a chemo infusion for a year. Um, and that's at University of, uh, of uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina. So. Next slide, please. Um, this is a photo of... Um, my early diagnosis. So I had just, we, uh, with my husband, we lived in California for two years. So he was doing his training at Stanford and I was at UCSF doing a nurse practitioner degree. And so I was very pregnant in the second year of my program. <laughs> and I gave birth to our son, Vilnus. And, um, and all along I had had a lump in my left breast that was getting harder and harder and it wasn't getting better. So at my first postpartum visit, um, uh, I said that we need to check this out further. I did have an ultrasound and they said it was likely lactational tissue, um, ducts, block ducts. Um, and so that opened up the whole path of um, stage one, triple negative breast cancer. Um, and so this is a photo of me weaning off the breastfeeding, um, preparing for the bilateral mastectomy. Andra, did you get any pushback from your, um, from your team? in terms of them taking you seriously? Um, well, I did two, two, I did a, a second opinion and we actually ended up going with a second team just because I felt the first team there was, there was pushback and it wasn't the right fit. And just, so we did go with a, a second team that was very supportive um, and very different in their approach too, so. So important to feel comfortable with the team who's yeah. providing you care. and. Um, I did say I wasn't going to ask you how old you were, but how old were you at this time of, of your initial diagnosis? I was 39. Okay. Yeah. Next slide, please. Yeah, so this was just um, me coming to help and take care of my nephew. So 
I remember uh, being really jet lagged. It's an eight hour difference from London to uh, California <laughs> and uh, and being, you know, the next day kind of going, oh, OK, I have a newborn or a close to newborn again. My my own son was seven, I think, at the time. So um, it was a steep learning curve, but it was a great bonding time. And just a, a mention, I mean, my sister dropped everything and flew from London to be with us in California. And then my father dropped everything and came. And so again, the power of um, support system and network and all that. So um, next, next slide. Um, so we then moved from California to Chicago to be closer to family. My in-laws live here in Chicago. Um, so I am married, uh, my husband, Alex. Um, it'll be uh, nine years this June, and then we have a five-year-old son right now. Um, but we moved to Chicago to have that family support, especially going through that early stage diagnosis and being in the middle of treatment. Um, so um, I started chemotherapy here at University of Chicago, and, um, and then I started getting involved in different local cancer resource centers. I did a, a wonderful uh, mindfulness and yoga teacher training that was geared for health and mental health professionals. And so these are just some um, examples of some of the workshops that I did at two, two cancer centers. Um, and I um, felt that this was incredibly fulfilling and I was, you know, I wasn't working as a nurse, um, but I was home with my son and was, um, yeah, on this new path. Uh, next slide. Was, was this still while you were getting treatment for your early stage diagnosis, Andra? Towards towards the end, you know, um, I, I went through the chemotherapy and then I still, and then I'm also BRCA1 positive. So then I removed my ovaries. Um, so that first year of treatment, it was towards the end of that first year that I started questioning, what do I want to do with my life? <laughs> and, and, you know, I didn't want to be um, a nurse at that point. I really wanted to be home with our son. And so this was a perfect fit. Um, and how did you how did you get into this? Was it something that you pursued or something that someone else suggested? Um, I've always had an interest in yoga. I've been practicing for for years, um, but it was the mindfulness piece that I didn't have experience with. And so that's where um, I just started looking at programs that also teach mindfulness. Um, and then when I found a match that was focused on um, um, professionals. So it was myself as a nurse, and then I was with 10 other um, social workers doing this program, um, teach mindfulness and being able to teach mindfulness and yoga in clinical contexts. And so it was just a perfect match. Um, my wonderful teacher, um, Christy um, Brendel, uh, ran that work, ran that teacher training. And so that opened up a whole new, whole new avenue for me. Um, That's wonderful. Thanks for sharing. You're welcome. And then this is my four years later, almost to the day um, I was diagnosed with a recurrence. So this is my metastatic breast cancer diagnosis. And this photo is taken about a day after I was diagnosed. And initially it was just, a, um, it was in my sternum. Um, so that's where the shadow on, the, on my chest just reflects. Um, it was from the window. There was a sign in the window and it points right to where the met was. And then I also had chest lymph node um, uh, affect my, my, my lymph nodes in my chest were affected as well. Um, I had a little bit in the lungs. And so this started my metastatic journey four years later. Um, it was a pouring, pouring rain day of rain. And so that's, um, that's the middle picture. And then, uh, you know, starts a whole new journey, hospital visits. And I just included like the hallways that you Chicago always have some sort of art exhibits. And I just feed off of these art exhibits, these pictures that I just photograph over and over and over and just give, it gives me light. So. Um, what, what was it that led to your diagnosis? Was it a symptom or was it a regular scan? I had pain right here, um, right at the sternum. And at first I thought it was villainous that was just kind of rough housing with me and maybe kicked me in the chest, but it turned out that it wasn't. Um, so the pain got worse and contacted my oncologist and said something doesn't feel right. So we waited a bit. I took some, you know, some medication and yeah, then we took a, had a scan and it was, yeah, the recurrence. So, um, and just, just briefly, um, currently um, it's, I'll be living with NBC for two years, um, two years this May. 
Um, and I have been through a lot of different treatments that have not worked. So I've been on two clinical trials. Um, I've been through various chemotherapies, two, Im two immunotherapies. Um, and then just last week, I was diagnosed with brain met. Um, so I'm starting radiation therapy on Monday. Um, so that's where I am today. Um, taking it one day at a time. And with, with triple negative, the tell me if I'm correct here, because I, I don't live with, with triple negative disease, but because there are no receptors, targeted therapy is something that those of, of you with triple negative aren't able to take. You have to take the more, uh, the systemic IV chemotherapies typically, is that right? Yes, yes, yes. There is the targeted, um, the um, forgive me, my brain isn't working right now, but the, the sasituzumab, uh, which is um, in any case, that's, that was like the most targeted um, okay. out, out of the bunch, but <laughs> forgive my, my brain. <laughs> we are developing new, more targeted therapies. I think Tridolvi is the, the um, brand name of Saxitizumab, yeah. um, which is its first in its class, brand new, something that was um, touted as being such a, a breakthrough, but yeah. um, doesn't work for everybody because no one is exactly the, the same. So in addition to chemotherapy, I think you also mentioned you're going to be going through some radiation. Have you done radiation before? Um, I've had a single dose of radiation to my sacrum because I have uh, mats in my sacrum. So that was just one episode one day. Um, so this is the first time that I'm having a longer course. So radiation. Yeah. Well, since we're talking about art, all that, I fully expect to see a very beautiful uh, painted mask. Um, and we'll, we'll definitely put that on. I, I, every time I see the, the masks that they paint for kids, too, I get so excited because, you know, opportunity to do something interesting with uh, the pieces of, uh, of the um, treatment that, that we can. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, so this was my foray into the MBC community. Um, it took me actually several months to kind of um, explore this area, but um, for the first nine months, I actually didn't tell many people about my diagnosis. I wasn't ready. Um, I was on a PARP inhibitor, so I had very few side effects. I looked normal. I felt normal. Um, so it was just my closest, closest family that knew about my diagnosis. But then once um, once that stopped working, I was ready to dive into what's out there in the NBC community. And um, I did the Living Beyond Breast Cancer um, Hear My Voice Metastatic program, which was um, the doorway to meeting a lot of people, to connecting, um, to, to getting uh, your, my feet into advocacy. Um, and then the other organization that I've gotten involved with is Project Life, um, my passion and love for wellness and wellness within the context of metastatic breast cancer. And so um, I have finished the mentoring program, which you are director of Abigail. <laughs> so thank you very much for that. Um, and yeah, my leading forward into uh, social media, you know, it was like an onion of telling people, my family, my, my friends, community, and then social media. And it's been quite an interesting journey. Um, kind of opening up um, when I'm quite a shy person in, in reality. So uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so I can say that um, the uh, Andres, um, my sister's diagnosis was, um, was kind of life changing for me as well. And uh, it inevitably kind of came into the work that I was making. Um, so I was uh, looking at these kind of cloud forms and together we talked about silver linings um, and it just seemed that the projects that I was kind of involved with, I was bringing in a link to um, my sister. So there was the clouds and also this kind of a butterfly. And I think the butterfly was the first one that we really collaborated on together, um, even though I made the piece physically. Um, Andre made every decision, so I would send her a, a text message and I'd say like this way or that way, do we do this or do we do that? And then she'd kind of choose the direction, so it was kind of an interesting way to work together. Um, and then the, the butterfly on the left hand side is just kind of half a butterfly in that picture, but 
is quite a large um, a large kind of uh, volume that came out from the wall and she chose the colors. So do you want to say something about the colors? Yeah, so this is the metastatic breast cancer ribbon, which was um, um, which was designed and originated by Metaviver. I don't know who the person was. Abigail, do you know more about that? But um, but I it's a they hold the yeah. trademark though. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so um, you know this is a ribbon that um, is unique to metastatic breast cancer. We're all very familiar with the pink the pink breast cancer ribbon, but for but for our um, our community, we have our needs are very different, given that we are living with a disease that has no cure, and that is terminal. Um, and so those are the colors that we fed into the butterfly. You see the the green, the teal, and then the the pink because the um, the cancer originated in the breast, um, and then it has spread to other parts of the body. And so um, just being with my sister, drawing these ribbons, having my son see us there. Um, um, and then putting them up on the wall and just having having that um, form of self-expression um, and exploration was was great. So, so you um, Ilga mentioned text messages and then you're talking about being in person. So some of this collaboration was in person. Some of it was at a distance. Um, it was it was pretty much all at a distance. So we would meet on uh, FaceTime and uh, kind of sit together, uh, talk, usually video calls, um, more than voice calls. And um, and then we would kind of do things uh, together. So, you know, the, the kind of the, the project started uh, with, um, I can say for myself, just wanting to spend more time together and find an excuse to do that. And uh, um, we were already our very close, uh, close sisters, um, but, but we didn't kind of meet, you know, multiple times a week. I think it kind of really brought us, um, uh, you know, on an almost daily basis together. And, um, and then just in February, we had the exhibition here in London and at the very end of February, so about a month ago, and Andre was able to come to London, and then we picked up um, the first uh, kind of, uh, oh, actually, no, we, we were working together in, in Chicago. So maybe the next slide, we can do that one. Um, I was able to fly uh, last summer, even though the border was shut, um, I was able to get permission. It was a very, um, extensive process to uh, to apply for and get permission to travel and um, from London to Chicago and um, my son and I were able to um, spend time and see you know kind of, uh, during COVID uh, not being able to see family for I think it was two years I think um, but our mother had given uh, my sister this tablecloth on the left and it was a tablecloth she had uh, hand embroidered in the 1930s, we think. Um, wow. Yeah, and it kind of came through different family members to my mum, to our mum. And um, we found it really inspiring uh, because there were these shapes that kind of resonated. And in a way, it, it kind of started the collaboration uh, cross generations. You know, our, our grandmother uh, died a number of years ago, but she was in a way collaborating with us through this tablecloth and her stitches. Um, wow. Yeah. And just, it was, it was, it was literally like an aha moment because if you look at the tablecloth, I mean, those are breasts there. They could be clouds. They could be breasts. There was, I mean, it was, it was this moment where we said we have to run with this. Um, so. Uh, maybe I can have the next slide. Yeah, so I think we started with the tablecloth. Um, I don't know if Laura, you can get the first. Is it is it playing? The top is a video. I don't know if it's um able Ooh. to play. Um, oh, I'm totally not set up to share the audio on sharing oh, okay. the screen. I apologize. <laughs> don't worry. Um, in the edited was, version that we share, I will be sure to do that. <laughs> okay, no worries. Um, it was just to show that uh, we chose kind of a rubbing technique, you know, something mm -hmm. that was really um, very direct, you know, you put a piece of paper on top of the tablecloth, 
and then you take a pencil or a crayon and you basically kind of rub is something that um, maybe children <laughs> children do in uh, in school and we started with this so there's a picture of my hands kind of rubbing um, and then Andre was also cutting out shapes so we cut out uh, clouds and then we would rub those um, those shapes and this was inspired by an artist called Max Ernst so it's his hands in the bottom middle of the slide and uh, he he was somebody who used uh, rubbing or uh, frottage in his uh, paintings and drawings. Um, yeah, so I think that was people do that, people do that on like um, uh, monuments or old graves and things like that too, right? Yeah, is yeah. You... Of, is that part of his technique? It from a like um, to to um, save or to document something that's old, or is it more about making something new? I think it's more about making something new. So you can take, you know, you can kind of, I mean, he was doing these kind of richly textured patterns that would be quite difficult to draw, you know, if you were to try to draw that. So sure. the rubbing in a way is a bit of a shortcut because you can, you can kind of generate a, a texture or a pattern quite quickly. Um, but yeah, oh. for us, this was our way in. Um, to the work that we did together. Um, next slide. Oh, there's the video. Yeah, so I think um, around this time, I was, I'm a member of an artist run uh, space here in London. And I was thinking that we, you know, I, I said, I said to Andre, you know, should we propose an exhibition and I wanted to use that as a kind of a commitment you know now we have a space we have a time um, it was nearly a year in advance I think it was maybe not quite um, a year and I just wanted to have that uh, kind of ahead of us as something that we would be moving towards um, and then that on the left hand side is the uh, the poster we use the same rubbing from the tablecloth and on the right hand side is the installation shot. So together we put this, um, we put the things, everything up on the wall. Um, next slide, please. So on these times that you guys are talking, you're, you're actually making the art together. Andra directing and Ilga actually, well, actually this picture looks like more that you were drawing on yourself. <laughs> yeah, it was a mix, Abigail. There were some things that Ilga was doing on her own and then some things that we did together. Um, like the, we'd be just be talking and rubbing at the same time. Um, and then we also did a lot of note taking, like we both have our journals and um, Ilga would be going to museums um, and coming back and we'd be discussing about artists. And so I'm learning about different artists that I've never heard about. Um, and it's just so stimulating. And then these ideas would just, we come across different theories and different um, and so it was that it was just that's how it evolved. Um, and this this one right here, um, Ilga, do you want to start just the, the lead in? Yeah, so I went to an exhibition um, here in London. There's a, a brilliant um, place called the Drawing Room. They always have amazing exhibitions. And there was an exhibition on figurative drawing inspired by Hans Bellmer. And his work is in the bottom uh, left hand corner. And basically when I saw it, I thought, oh, it's such, a, it's such an interesting technique. He kind of inks up a surface and then he puts a piece of paper on top and then pulls it away. So it's, again, it's very direct. It's like a transfer, a print in a way. And um, I said to Andre, I said, this is something that we could also try out. So, um, so then she kind of inked up her, her uh, parts of her body and pressed them against uh, paper. It was first pressed against um, a glass and then I would press the paper over the glass. Um, and for me, this was something that I just did on my own in my room. Um, and it was very, very grounding because it was me saying, this is, I am, I am here, you know, bearing witness. So I did it with my feet and then I did it with my hands and then I did it with my breast. So. Next slide, please. I, I just wanted to ask you a question about the color. Uh, the teal, was that was that from the, the metastatic ribbon? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And I think, is it teal that's, it, I think it's green that's the triumph of spring over winter. 
um, I'm forgetting the, the, um, teal is spirit, uh, spirituality and, um, and <laughs> yeah, spirituality and meaning. I forgot it too. <laughs> Well, that goes along with the mindfulness and those yeah. other things that you were cultivating as the kind of next steps for you, too. Yes. Um, yeah, so in October, um, we have a week's holiday here um, in the UK, and my family and I went to Bath. So there's the old Roman baths, the top right hand uh, picture is the kind of, um, yeah, that one. It's like, a, you know, kind of a, a really beautiful uh, a bath that's uh, from the Roman times. And um, it has a really extensive exhibition kind of underneath. You can walk through these, uh, these kind of holes and tunnels underneath the, um, the bath. And one of the things that I came up, up to on the lower uh, right hand corner were um, this practice of throwing, um, kind of writing onto lead, uh, folding it up and then throwing that little lead um, uh, note uh, into the bath. And it was kind of a message to the gods, uh, whatever it was that you wanted to say. And this is what the Romans did um, back in the Roman times. And that night, uh, Andre and I were talking and um, I said, you know, this could be something that um, perhaps we can incorporate into our practice. Um, you know, uh, think of something that we could uh, throw into a river or um, into a body of water and use it as a, as a bit of a performance. And uh, that's what we did. So uh, a few weeks later, uh, we decided to collect some leaves and some stones. And uh, we wrote a few things on the leaves and the stones. And then we um, each went to um, a river and we were on a video call at the same time and we threw in our um, stones and our leaves. And just a little side story, when I was driving there to the river, you won't believe it, I was listening to the radio and there was a song that came on about going down to the river. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was a beautiful sunny day in Chicago, um, um, cool, but very, um, very symbolic to, to write on these stones, um, our, our intentions, either things we want to keep or let go of. Um, so it was, yeah. Yeah, it was actually interesting that after we did it, we kind of uh, reflected on what we had done. And Andre threw her stones into the river to have them kind of grounded or rooted to the riverbed. Um, in this way that the water would kind of go over um, continually over the stones. Uh, whereas I took a completely different approach. I wanted to throw away, um, uh, you know, my stones, the things that I had written onto my stones. Mm. Um, so it was just interesting that we did the same exercise. We had the same kind of <laughs> approach um, to, to kind of coming together and doing it. Um, but then how we did it or what we were thinking about um, while we were doing it was completely different. Hmm. Did you all explore maybe why that was or how it had a different connection based on each of your experiences? Yeah, well, I think one of my, um, one of my stones, uh, the words was guilt. Hmm. So I, I find it still quite difficult to talk about that because it could have been me, you know, I, I could have, I had the genetic test done and I don't have that gene. Um, mm. So I think that's um, from my, from my side of things, I was trying to kind of push that away, put, put it. <laughs> sure. We, we talk a lot about survivor's guilt and the, the, this idea that, you know, our loved ones, um, you know, we could be in the same situation, especially for those of us who have the germ germline mutations. So it's so important to talk about that. Um, should we go on to the next slide? I just want to say one more thing on that slide, if that's possible. Um, um, I wrote um, several things on on several rocks, but this is the one that I think resonates with me most. It's time. So I just want more time. Um, and so writing that on the rock and throwing that in and just knowing that it's, it's, it's right there. It's there, but it's not there. 
so and the water just running over so yeah it was a significant um performance <laughs> next slide please um, so I'm always digging around for some sort of free virtual conferences and uh, things, that, things that like uplift. And then I've been following Sounds True through my yoga um, training and they offer a lot of different interesting things. And so this was a conference um, on hope. It was based on Jane Goodall's new book, based on her book. And they had a whole panel of different professionals, artists, um, um, uh, musicians, you name it, um, on their panel giving presentations. And so my sister and I, I told her about it and she joined up and we, we listened to all the, all the presenters and kind of drew, took little seeds of, of wisdom from, from the presenters. Um, but we were especially drawn to this one presenter called Chan Hellman, who's written a book on hope. And he's actually a hope researcher based out of, I think, University of Oklahoma. Um, and we both read his book, we ordered it and read his book and um, we were just drawn to his kind of theory on hope because hope is actually, um, in, in my thoughts, it's, it's a very complicated concept. Um, it's, we use the word hope so often, I feel, in the, in the cancer community, but it's actually a very uh, deep concept that's very different and it's, it's actually been studied. There's research on hope um, in, um, uh, ter you know, terminal illness and end of life, and what hope means in those in those circumstances. And so, um, he gave us a really nice framework. I'll just mention it very briefly. Um, um, he has three 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 factors. Um, one is to have a goal, um, and the whole idea is that hope is something that can be increased, um, and um, and, and can be changed. Um, and so you have a goal. So for us, our goal was this project, our exhibit, our collaboration um, with that very specific intention of working on that. Um, his next concept is pathways. Um, so these are, he, pathways are like roadmaps. So what's, what roads are you gonna take to get to that goal? And um, it's, it's like reframing your goals um, to fit your situation um, and so that was our pathways was working and meeting daily having our facetime chats um, our plans our agendas our you know keeping on task with things like that and then the third component is agency and he also calls it willpower um, and that's dedicated mental energy towards that task um, and you're actually taking action and you're doing it now and so i feel like working with my sister has been such a a delight because when I haven't been feeling well and I've been out in bed with side effects and I'm not and I'm knocked out I know that I have a partner that I'm working with that understands um, and that that mental energy then once those side effects pass it comes it seeps back in do you know what I mean Abigail like it's oh yes <laughs> it, it comes back and then again we can flow um, and work on our goals and 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 hope so um, I don't know, Ilga, if you want to say anything more about um, this section. Yeah, I was going to say that um, you know, that kind of uh, reading the reading the book was uh, was really transformational. It was he was a very good speaker in the conference, and then you know, both of us bought the book, we read it, and I think um, you know, this whole kind of thing about taking action, even the smallest, you know, one small step, um, is an action that could generate hope. And it was a way of reframing or rethinking everything that we had done before, the rubbings and the transfers and the performance with the throwing into the river, that all of these were our actions. And we would be, you know, it's a way of kind of um, seeing it again in a different way that all those small things um, that we had done. You know, people were asking, what are you doing together? What are you doing together? What's this exhibition about? And, uh, you know, this is what it was about, you know, spending time together, uh, doing things, um, seeing where our conversations uh, take us. Um, and then the, the conference and the book um, helped us to uh, think about it in a different way. Um, what was the name of the book? I, I must have missed it. 
Um, it's called Hope Rising. I got it right here. Okay. Um, Hope Rising. How the science of hope can change your life. And so he's actually goes into the evidence based um, studies and he's got scales to measure hope. Um, but he talks about hope across a lot of different contexts and situations with one chapter on uh, on illness as well. And so um, it's an interesting read. We, we did not receive any money to uh, uh, to suggest this book or anything like that, but uh, certainly it seems like you guys were able to take the concepts from the book and apply it to something that was that was already going on. So mm -hmm. uh, I was also just going to say that um, in my teaching as well, you know, I mentioned the idea generation that I, I facilitate. And I think in that sense, um, as well, the students, you know, hope to generate something. They hope to do well with their projects. They hope to, um, you know, get a good idea. You know, something um, that is is uh, you know kind of on, on that kind of level. And and being able to see my uh, my teaching practice also um, in a new light. I think based on this uh, this um, this kind of work that we've done together here. And, and amazing how the same concepts can apply very differently to different people in different contexts at different times. Yes. And, and even just the two of you um, in your different experiences with the same issue. Yes. Yeah. Um, next slide. Um, so this is a weekly uh, NBC support group that I go to. Um, it's a local group. Um, and it's a cancer resource center called Wellness House. It's in Hinsdale, Illinois. And uh, it's a group of us uh, women that meet every Tuesday morning and it's guided by a um, social worker who is wonderful. And I um, you know, have been telling my group about my sister's project and we, um, uh, in, I wanted to invite my sister to come to the group and do a little, um, do a little bit of her sketching um sketching work with the group so i started um the group with a little bit of a meditation a five minute meditation just to ground everybody and then ilga took over so um yeah it was a very um a very simple um kind of movement uh breathing and together with the breath and the movement you're also kind of making marks on the paper so we covered a few different ways of doing that and um, in just a few minutes, you could uh, kind of generate something and then have a look at it. And I remember one of the participants said um, something that you could try out as a daily practice to add a three minute um, breath and movement sketch to your day as a way to just kind of um, like similar to journaling. But instead of using uh, words, you would just use um, marks, lines, shapes. And what's really interesting is like then Ilga would say, then move your paper and, you know, turn it around. And then you're looking at the marks from a different perspective. And it was something so simple yet so profound. It was like, wow, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, thank you for inviting me into that space. Thank you for coming. It, it was, everyone loved it. So. So, so Ilga, are you taking um, reservations so other people could invite you to come to their support groups to do this sort of thing? <laughs> um, yeah, if I if I have the time, yeah. It, it just it sounds like something that that's so simple yet so profound at the the same mm -hmm. time. Yeah, I think um, it kind of crosses in in a lot of the work that I do. Um, you know, it is. Um, I mean, the, the, the department that I work in kind of says that they're involved in transformative education. So mm -hmm. it is these kind of simple, simple things, um, but it also takes a certain amount of, I think, uh, confidence to be able to work in that environment, to be able to deliver something like that, to be able to um, invite people into that space or, or into your space or to create a space like that. So um, it's something that I've been doing for uh, a decade or just over a decade. Um, and I know my own confidence has increased uh, based on this experience and um, this last year as well. Um, next, next slide. Mm. Yeah, so um, 
I mentioned I was a member of that artist run space uh, where we had our exhibition and we have these kind of quarterly meetings where all the members get together and talk about you know business <laughs> boring business things and uh, also upcoming programming so you know who's doing what where and and how does it fit in and one of the members um essie eschen was talking about a walking art project that she was instigating and um invited uh you know, anybody to propose a, a walk or to propose an event that she would then, you know, that would then add, be added into, um, into her project. And I spoke to Andre about this and I said, oh, this is, this sounds like maybe something that we could uh, do together. I also had an interest in walking um, kind of independently. I was looking at, um, I've been doing a lot of walking during COVID, uh, during the lockdowns, or um, you know, being able to uh, to get out of the house and and just walk somewhere, and just to um, working from home uh, to kind of get rid of um, you know, kind of feel uh, uplifted. So it was something that I was doing anyway, and then we decided together to propose um, walk with us which was a synchronous walk. So we kind of sent out to um, our friends and uh, on social media uh, invitation to walk at the same time. So we chose a time and we said, you know, in, in, all, in all the time zones, it's you know, this time in London, that time in Chicago, that time in California um, and so forth. And um, we had over 165 people walking with us. Um, in the UK, USA, Canada, Latvia, Denmark, Netherlands, Italy, Finland, and Australia. Um, adults, children, 11 dogs, and one horse. Um, <laughs> the, the horse, the horse is, I have dear friends of mine that live in North Carolina and they have a farm and animals. And so my dear friend Pat walked with her horse. <laughs> Thanks, Pat. <laughs> Yeah, so we had um, the picture on the far right is um, the the right side of the picture is uh, my sister's walk. So snowy Chicago, cold and, you know, kind of white. And then on the left side of that photograph is is my walk. Um, and I walked together with my husband and my son um, along the Thames. So it was a half hour uh, together. Um, my parents, our parents walked in Montreal. And um, yeah, it was uh, lots of um, lovely, really, really wonderful um, pictures and comments. Uh, people were kind of flooding our social media with their walks um, and who they were walking with. And um, there might have been more people walking, but these are the ones that we were able to um, kind of count up. So thank you to Essie for the invitation and to everybody that uh, was able to walk together with us. Yeah, thank you to our friends, family, and community for walking with us. Um, it was um, uh, a bit of a surreal feeling to know that we're all out there together um, in nature, in our own corners of the world. Um, and it's not associated with a fundraiser. It's just, it's like there's something so freeing about it. Um, and so here in Chicago, I walked with my husband, son, um, my in-laws, um, and my sister-in-law and her dog, um, and we walked to a local park. Um, luckily, there was a, my, my son wasn't into walking too long, so there was a, 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 a he was able to go um, sledding down a hill <laughs> after we got to the park, so it all worked out. So thank you, everyone. Um, next slide. Uh, yeah, so we just wanted to say uh, also that the exhibition at the end of February started the same week as the invasion of Ukraine. Um, and uh, we just wanted to, you know, kind of make a connection. We put um, the image on the far left is from the exhibition. So we were able to find um, the Ukrainian uh, flag colors and, and put up a um, you know, kind of a, we stand with Ukraine, um, but it really touches home, you know, these kind of stories of refugees, um, you know, that's our story, it's our grandparents' story. Um, our grandparents were on both sides of the, on both sides were uh, refugees from Latvia. Um, and, uh, you know, this, the, the other three pictures were us as teenagers and our first visit to Latvia, our mother organized um, a family trip where 
we went with our grandparents and it was their first time uh, returning to their um, hometown of Leopaya um, in 50 years, I think it was something or close to 50 years. And uh, seeing, you know, visiting their house uh, and seeing everything through their eyes, um, a country and a city that they had left and were not able to return to for all that time. So, um, you know, it was a, it was kind of a happening that same, you know, two days, I think uh, two or three days after uh, the start of the war, um, we felt that we had to, uh, you know, kind of show our support for Ukraine. Um, next, next slide. This is my son Vilmus, um, and he walked into this room. The walls were completely bare, and he just started decorating and doing his own exhibit. And what's funny is because I was really nervous at first. I thought, oh, no, we're going to have to take it all down. And then my sister said, let's keep it up. That's his exhibit. That's his work. And so he took the string, and he strung it all around the room, um, and Ilda, there were some people that came and said that that reminded them of some sort of artist that had done that in the past. I don't remember his name, but um... I think it was Eva Hess. Eva Hesse. So um, that was the I think that was the comment. Um, but yeah, I thought you know he's he's a big drawer. Um, so. I know for my son never never wanted to draw so I, drawing is such a huge part of my life and my own child refuses to uh refuse to touch it so with villainous uh with my nephew i see somebody who is drawing all the time and he just goes through page after page after page so he was putting up you know at his height um as a nearly six-year-old height uh, the, the lower part of the wall, <laughs> uh, his drawings. And then we were, I gave him a job to use. We were putting up the paper with blue tack and you just have to kind of uh, rub it a little bit to kind of soften it and make it sticky. And I had given him that job. I said, you can take, make little balls. We'll just need to keep it coming. We'll need lots and lots of blue tack. And he was very good at that. And then he started to use uh, the blue tack to put up some string that he had, or we had brought from home. And he made a string installation. And uh, it's actually worked out uh, perfectly because it tied together all of our um, active, you know, all of our actions and there was this kind of under kind of toe of tying everything together. And um, yeah, we also made a special thank you for to Vilnius. He brought everything together because there was a, a woman that commented and said, it's like walking into your personal sketchbook art. It was a it was like a timeline of our, you know, almost year. So that string was like a, a timeline that brought it all together. So. Um, and just having him there and seeing this, because we pulled him out of kindergarten for a week, and I thought, oh, you know, he's going to miss a week of school. But what he got from this trip was phenomenal. So um, hopefully he, he remembers. <laughs> he especially loved the double decker buses sitting at the top, at the front <laughs> the top was his spot. So he could get a fantastic view of London and, um, yeah. Yeah, he was going to museums as well with my husband. So while my sister and I were planning and working and getting ready, um, he did a lot of great museums. So I'm I'm always reminded of the quote that uh, children spell love T I M E, and mm -hmm. uh, just you know going back to the the time that you had on your on your rock, Andra, and how you've pulled your child into this experience that you're having. You know, you're making those memories with him and spending that time with him. Right. Much more important than kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> That'll all come. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. So these are just a few photos of uh, the visitors that came to our exhibit. It was a mix of uh, some family, um, Ilga's colleagues, um, some artists from her from her group um, and, and friends friends and it was my first experience kind of um, 
taking someone along that sketchbook and walking through by the walls and, and explaining and giving like that private tour guide of our of our of our work. And so it was really um, it was really special. I'd never done anything like that before. Um, yeah, we ended up giving, um, you know, kind of, I think the work was, uh, it would, it benefited from having uh, our explanation. And I think in a way, this talk as well, that we have been able to talk about the work because we had the practice during those two days in the exhibition. So um, it was pretty busy, you know, we had people arriving and then one of us would stay with one group and then the other one and then we'd try to catch them up and, and finish it together. So, um, you know, we kind of learned, I think, learning about the work through uh, finding the words to talk about it um, mm. and uh, seeing, you know, it was, uh, I know people, the second weekend I was there by myself because um, uh, Andre had uh, gone home again and you know, I think it was just that, um, you know, kind of that, the kind of the gravity of it, or there was this something that was so kind of magical that we had achieved. And um, yeah, and it was, you know, there was also, and also so much, uh, so much work, so, um, so much thought, so much energy had gone into, into this exhibition. And we'll be continuing. So we have plans, we have some uh, things that we didn't get done, um, ran out of time to uh, to finish them. So we have a few things um, around mending that we wanted to pick up um, and also some free writing. So we mentioned the journaling earlier through drawing, but also using words and just kind of writing. So uh, that was something that we wanted to do. And um, also putting maybe some kind of a, um, a video format. We were thinking about a book format, but maybe the video would be um, a way to have um, our tour in a way, our story, our, our words accompany the image. Um, and, and we could probably put in a lot more. Yeah, finding words to talk about it, exactly. Finding the words. There were there were also a lot of concepts that we didn't get to for for myself, uh, things such as legacy um, and family, um, preparing, um, holding hope on the one hand, but preparing and being ready and to journey together with my sister and family doing that. So um, and all those concepts of loss and grief um, and healing. Um, so we there's. There's a lot of things we're still going to explore. So, I, I love that this is not a static project that you, you know you began and it has just evolved over time as as time has gone on. Um, anyway, everything about this is just really amazing. Thank you, Abigail. And so here we are, sisters. <laughs> <laughs> I'm lucky to have one. Very grateful to have one. Yeah, so am I. <laughs> and grateful for this webinar. Thank you. Well, I'm just so thankful that you both have been so honest and transparent to put out, you know, going through this experience together and talking about it, about it with people um, that, that you've been willing to let people into your relationship. I think one of the things that we talk about a lot in our groups as I started with is just that our families are so deeply affected by this diagnosis, but then just like there's very little support for caregivers, there's very little support for families. Um, you know, the families are grieving in their own way, but yet, you know, it's not really something that that's talked about. Um, I, I've heard people liken it to, to miscarriages how you know there's this thing that's so difficult that you go through but nobody there's no space to talk about it nobody wants to hear about it um and you know that that piece is is something that people carry um for for their their entire lives um ilga you mentioned just the the concept of of guilt that that when there's a, a family mutation that you know that doesn't just affect the person who tests positive, it affects the people who test negative. And, and to remember that and to, to include that as, as we're thinking about the effects of, of metastatic breast cancer. So um, 
So I'm going to say right now, we want you guys to come back and talk to us about the evolution of your project and and how it um, how how it affects people or how you guys are expanding it. Um, I hope you'll think about doing a um, an installation in the states, maybe you know something a little bit closer than, than London. But um, I can see just how meaningful it's been for for both of you. Um, we, we don't we're technically at the the end of our time, but um, I, I ask each of our, our guests to to give us a, a word that they feel like exemplifies um, our, our discussion. Um, and there were so many words that I heard that were woven throughout your presentation today and throughout out your project um, that seemed so very meaningful, but um, is, is there a word, Ilga, maybe that you can think of that um, that exemplifies your um, your participation with your sister in this project? I don't know, love, I suppose, love, sister, hope, all, all of the, all of that. Those are good ones. Yeah. How about you, Andra? I'm, I'm in the same way. I've been <laughs> connection, connection, which is love, because it just, there are really no words. Sure. To explain the feeling of that kind of closeness and 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 evolution of our relationship. Yeah. I think the the word that I was um, thinking as you guys were talking was the soul connection that that you guys were connected in a very intangible way, but in a very very deep and and meaningful way. Laura, what was uh, did was there a word that uh, came up for you today? I was thinking like transparency, right? Like you're going through something so deep and so personal. How you started off earlier, you know, the first nine months not necessarily sharing with everybody, but then to expose this on an exhibit level internationally, you know, sharing your experience, being here today on the webinar. I mean, there's just something that is both individual and so large at the same time. Absolutely. Yeah. Very beautiful. Thank yeah. You. I think it's been a real challenge. I think for both of us, we are uh, shy. I think naturally shy. <laughs> I have been naturally shy and, um, and, you know, kind of being, uh, being able to kind of put yourself out there has been, has been really transformative. Um, also very empowering as well. And that's where you grow. That's like that window where you grow. Yes. Yes. Abigail, what about you? Your word? Oh, it was the soul connection. Oh, the soul right? connection. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Just the, the deepness of, of that. Um, you know, obviously you're connected through blood, but but also connected mm -hmm. um in a, another way. So um yes, definitely want you guys to come back and and update us on on the project and Andrea, we're, we're going to be thinking about you as you embark on this other treatment for the brain mets. Um, I, you know, I have a dear friend who's been living with brain mets um, from MBC for nine years. So, um, you know, there are those people who are, are able to um, have good, uh, good reactions to the medication and the, um, the treatment. So we'll, we'll be pulling for you. Thank you. Um, start Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah. All right, so um, thank you all for uh, coming and um, listening to our NBC Sunday series. Um, we have some amazing uh, guests coming up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we're gonna be talking about Medicare. We're gonna be talking about all of those pesky ways of making sure that your medication is covered through health insurance. Um, we have Julia and Christine who will be talking about the GRASP program as well as um, a husband and wife caregiver and stage four patient team who have developed a caregiver's guide to cancer who will be coming on to talk about their um, efforts and their experiences uh, to support caregivers. So lots of great things coming up. Um, and remember, yes, we do these webinars live. We love having people participate the information that is shared is then repackaged into our podcast. Um, we also have a lot of the video on YouTube and then a lot of the um, resources are also shared 
on the various pages at survivingbreastcancer.org, which is divided into whether you're a family member, you're a child, you're a healthcare provider, you're a patient, you're somebody who's early stage, there's something there for everybody. So feel free to check out the events, check out the resources, and uh, drop us a line. Thank, Thank you. you all for attending. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.